Well, come on, let somebody put your hands together. And, and, um, hallelujah. Let me make sure my sound is right so that I won't be distracted by my sound. Um, before I do that, though, yeah, I need you to, to tinkle with it a little bit. I don't know what it is. Father, we take authority. Or what takes place in this building. Father, we will not tolerate any spirit of infirmity, any kind of infirmity to operate in this house. As for me and my house, we serve God. So in the name of Jesus, we release health and healing and the will of God to be done and we bind the hands of the enemy against God's people in the name of Jesus and everybody that's agreement shout amen that's, that's it that's fine y'all may be seated thank y'all so much great job I would kiss all of y'all but all y'all not girls so I can't do that um, now this morning I want to continue what I started last Sunday. We deemed this year, 2024, the year of fixed purpose. And I, I want to just review a little bit. God is about to change the continents of the church through a revelation of goodness. Now, I have to keep saying it until it gets inside of you until you start to respond to what you hear. Because nothing doesn't happen just because you desire it to happen. It happens because you, you make the choice to engage in that so that it will happen. So, you know, the Bible says many times, and again I say unto you. So God is about to change the continents of the church through a revelation of goodness. You might need to close your eyes and, and ears to what you're hearing in order for this to come past. Moses wanted to see the glory. And God says, I'm going to show you all my goodness. You're getting ready to walk into a new season. I believe it is a makeup season for us. I believe it's a breakthrough season for many of us <clears throat> where you will be equipped with new keys to the kingdom. I want you to have an expectation of God giving you some new keys. It will be a season where you'll be shown what I honestly believe and I'm reaching for supernatural kindness. I'm looking for the goodness of God in the land of the living. Is anybody looking for God in the land of the living? It'll be supernatural kindness on a different dimension you have ever seen before. Now, we've got to believe God for this. This is your season to shine brighter than ever before. Now, the, the key to this happening in your life is Proverbs chapter 4, verse 25, I believe, in the Passion Translation, which says, set your gaze on the path that's before you. With fixed purpose, looking ahead, ignoring all of life's Distractions or ignoring life's distractions. You and I know that life will be full of distractions. So the scripture tells us that we've got to learn how to ignore those life distractions. We had distractions in 23. We'll have them in 24. You had them before you left your house. You'll have them before you leave the building. All of that was a distraction. We're worshiping God. We're in his presence. And the enemy comes to bring a distraction. 
Some distractions are demonic in nature. Other distractions are just human in nature. And we've got to become aware of what is a distraction. So, so what is a distraction? A distraction is just merely a diversion. It's a thing that prevents someone from giving full attention to something. We can all attest to this. You, you're focusing on something and then something happens and all of a sudden you lose your focus. We drive down the belt when there's a car pulled over on the side and there's some accident. Everybody is distracted by it. Causes everybody to slow down so that they, we say, so that they can be nosy. But you and I know it's a distraction. So we live in a world that is full of distractions. There will be personal distractions. There will be relational distractions. There will be mental and emotional and, and spiritual distractions. And we, if we're going to see the will of God done in our generation, if we're going to champion what God is doing, if we want to be people who will contribute to the well-being and the success for this world that we live in, if we want to walk in the assignment and the purpose for why we're in the earth, we've got to become good at ignoring distractions. You can't even have a good marriage if you don't learn how to do that. Now, here's what I did not say. I did not say you have to ignore your spouse. Tell them, no, pastor didn't say that. I said we have to ignore distractions. And the only way that we can do it, we've got to start to recognize that's a distraction. So it's important for us to, to, to really recognize what it is and then to start to ignore. Now let's look at someone who was distracted. I want you to go to Luke chapter 10. And the whole story is in verse 38 through 42 in the NIV version. Here Jesus comes over Martha's house and Mary's. I assume it's both of them. I could be wrong. And Mary sits at the feet of Jesus to listen to what he's saying. But in verse 40, it says, but Martha was distracted. Oh, my God. And then it tells us how she was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Life is full of distractions. What I got to do for my work the next day, what I got to do for my children, what I got to do to check on my health. I got all these pills and just full of distractions. And in and I want you to know, that's all they all are. But her distraction was, she was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. See, when Jesus came to your house, he didn't just come by himself. He didn't just come with 12 disciples. They had at least 70 plus 12. So can you imagine somebody just knock on your door and just, hey, now, all of a sudden, Martha is overwhelmed. My God, who's going to cook for them? Who's going to make sure that they're taken care of? And Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus. She is not distracted by how many people came in. And so Martha being distracted, she came to Jesus and, and asked. She said, Lord, don't you care? Wow, that's pretty strong that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? By myself? <laughs> Tell her to help me. And I love how Jesus so gently handled Martha, he called her name twice, Martha, Martha. <laughs> he said, you are worried and upset about many things. Worry and being upset is only a distraction. Notice he said you are worried and upset about many things. Now just think about my life. When, when I'm worried and get upset about something, it's just a distraction. He said to her, 
you are worried and upset about many things. Upset about, upset about. It's amazing how when you get upset about one thing, it, it, it brings in the focus all other things you're upset about. Hey, you didn't pick your shoes up. You, you left the microwave dirty. Can you put the seat down? I am not your mother. <laughs> Do you notice that when, when you get distracted, all of a sudden you'll pull into an area that you didn't intend to go in, but distractions doesn't just distract you. It turns your focus to it and causes you to be pulled into that reality. Now you are upset over many things. Stuff that happened last week, maybe six months ago. And now we're having conversations that we had before and we're repeating it. Why? Because we don't know how to ignore distractions. He goes on to say, he says, Mary has chosen what is better. Tell somebody there's something better than a distraction. It's what you were focusing on. That was what better. He said, but Mary has chosen what is better and it will not be taken away from her. Now, if you have fixed purpose, what you focus on will not be taken from you. But if you take your focus up on what you you should be focusing on, watch what happens. It will be taken from you. Do you realize that's the goal of Satan? He said, Satan, Jesus, you know, tells us in John 10, and he says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Now, all the time he isn't coming to kill, sometimes he's just there to destroy some stuff. He just won't mess something up. And all of a sudden, if you put your focus on that, you'll miss why Jesus came. He said, but I came that you might have what? Life and that you might have life to the full till it's overflowing. Not enjoying that because I'm overwhelmed by what this thief has been doing. Tell somebody it's only a distraction. I say this all the time, 80% of your marriage is doing well and 20% stink. Don't get distracted by the 20%. Stay focused. Think about it, they're in the garden. God says to Adam and Eve, of all the trees of the garden, you may freely eat, but don't get distracted with this one. What happened? They got distracted with the one that they wasn't supposed to look at. But of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, don't eat of that tree. And that's the very tree they ate of. Why? Because Satan used the tactic of distraction to remove their focus from God who had already provided for them all things for life and caused them to look at something and tell them what they do not have. That's how he trips us up all the time because he gets you to focus on what you don't have. You can't enjoy what you do have and move into what you need and what you can have because you're overwhelmed by what you don't have. It's just a distraction. Tell your neighbor, stop tripping. <laughs> now let me give you an example of a person, what it looks like. Let me give you a picture or imagery of what it looks like when we have people who will not be distracted, Amen. who will ignore distractions. The Bible says in Psalms 112, verses 6 through 8, and I'm reading that out of the Amplified Version. It says, he will not be moved forever. Wait a minute now. Here's a person that will not be moved. And they say they will not be moved forever. So what is moving you? Whatever is moving you and I, it's a, your distraction. Because there is a person and there are people who have the ability to not be moved. And here's a person, he will not be moved for how long? Forever. Almost sounds like Jesus, who's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. You want that in your relationships. I'm not going to be moved. You can turn your head around and spit green stuff. I ain't going nowhere. 
Now, we're so easily emotionally moved when people don't respond the way we would like them to respond. All of a sudden, we want to quit them and divorce them and move on from them, only to find somebody else that's going to spit green stuff too, and you're going to do the same thing again. But here's the man or woman of God, I won't be moved forever. See, we can't even be moved by our children. We raise our children in Christian homes and they don't always act like Christians. Like, man, my kids smoke more weed than I did when I wasn't saved. How is that humanly possible? They didn't grow up in that environment. They didn't smell weed in my house. We didn't watch it. We took the time to control the television and everything they look up. But what happened? You're not a good father. You're getting distracted now. You're going off the script now. You're not a, a good mother or a great mother because your kids don't do something. <laughs> Stop getting off script. It's only a distraction. Man. And see, you, you, how I know that you're distracted? You upset? Because your kid's smoking weed? I didn't teach that kid that. Where did they get that from? I, I ain't speaking to them. I don't want them around the house. Now you are not who you're supposed to be. Now notice what it did for you. It distracted you. Now you're out of character. Instead of being who you normally are, you can't be that anymore. Now, there's contention between you and your, your children because of what they're doing. Listen, you can smoke a tree down, ain't going to change me. You can roll a tree up in that joint, I'm still going to be your daddy. And I'm not going to be distracted because you smell like a tree, look like a tree, and got trees in your pocket. Why? That, that's what he said about this man. He cannot be moved. How long? Stop tripping over your kids and what they do. They're going to be all right. My Bible says, as for me and my house. Too bad they grew up in our house. Because them trees coming out of their pocket. At some point, they're going to serve God. And I'm okay. They're just building their story so that they can be a testimony of how good God is. Woo! Glory! You know God's been good to you. You was crazy. Some of you was on crack. And look at you now. You all right. Come on, let's give God the praise for that. He goes on to say about this person, he will not be moved forever. Why? He has fixed purpose. He's fixed some things in his life. He calls this person the uncompromisingly righteous. The right, the upward right, excuse me, in right standing with God, the uncompromising, the unyielding, Without exception. Absolute as believing in. Absolute as in adhering in. Absolute to a principle or to a position. There are people who are Dallas Cowboy fans. And listen to me. Let me say this. They need Jesus. They need, they need God. Yeah, they do. And after the service, I'm going to have a deliverance service. No, <laughs> no but they are, they are, they are unyielding in their commitment to that. So we see people do that in the, in the natural world. You, you can't talk them out of that. You, you want to fuss all day long? Just find a cowboy fan. You and him will be distracted all day. <laughs> Your day will be messed up arguing. It's not worth it, but I'm saying what they, what 
that's a that's a person who is unmovable. A person who is uncompromising, unyielding in their commitment to that team. He said, well, you are the uncompromising righteous. And he said, you shall be an everlasting remembrance. Now notice, when you will not be moved forever, you will be remembered forever. We talk about legacy. We talk about wanting to be remembered when you're going. Here are the people that will be remembered. People who operate in fixed purpose. They will always be remembered. Man, I remember they all oh, hell broke up against them and I and I and I saw them. I saw them say, Well, it ain't gonna happen to me. I saw them be attacked in their body, I saw them attacked in their finances, I saw their relationship, I saw them, and I just I watched them. And they came out on top. Why? They were uncompromisingly righteous in right relationship, in right standing with God. He goes on to say about those that will be remembered, an everlasting remembrance. He says, he shall not be afraid of evil tidings. Now look at me, look at me. When you can't be moved, fear cannot move you. See, th this thing bleeds over in every area of your life. It just doesn't stand small pockets, but when you are that kind of person, when you are fixed, purpose, he said, fear won't move you. There are so many people who love God but operate in fear and don't do nothing about it. People of fear of flying, fear of getting on cruise lines because they're afraid of drowning. There's so many fears of people who love God, tremendously love God. But they have never done anything about that distraction. And they have allowed a distraction to overwhelm them instead of allowing God to overwhelm them. You see, God wants to overwhelm you. People... Why? Because people are just afraid of dying. And I understand that because it's a natural action to be afraid of that which you do not understand. That's why when we used to go to those horror movies and we look in and go, dun dun. Dun dun. They about to grab that door. Dun dun. Don't do it. Because see, we can see what's behind the door. Don't do it. Dun dun. Dun dun. Dun dun. You idiot. You're going to die. You're dead. The unknown. But even the unknown doesn't move this man. Not knowing what's about to happen doesn't move him. He shall not be afraid of evil tithings. In other words, he will not be distracted. By fear, he will not be distracted by evil or bad news. Hey, the doctor come give you bad news. He's not moved. Whew. You believe in God for something and all hell break out. It looks like it's impossible. It looked impossible when God told you. Now the reverse of that, now everything breaks out. really looks impossible. But do you realize in order to bring that promise to pass, you cannot be moved. And as long as I moved and you moved, the promise can't be moved. God cannot move that promise into your life until you become unmovable about the promise he's made you. You get to practice living lives where you can be unmovable. You think that's what your relationship is about. God know you ain't perfect. He put two imperfect people together and just says, okay, work it out. What are you doing? You're in training to live a life where you cannot be moved. You're learning how to not to be frustrated by your relationships. Why? Because frustrations move you. It makes you have an attitude toward each other. Why you always got an attitude when I say something? Because something is moving you. Something has distracted you. 
How do I know that? You weren't acting like that the day you said I do. <laughs> He's so fine. <laughs> she got a big butt. <laughs> oh my God. Larry and everything distracted. She keep walking past the TV. Excuse me. Let me go on. I'm trying to watch a game. <laughs> That's a good distraction, let me just tell you. You got to know which is the good ones and what's the bad ones. <laughs> uh, praise the Lord. Verse 80 said, his heart is established, steady, and he will not be afraid. In other words, he will not be distracted while he waits to see his desires established. I'm not going to be uh, I'm not going to be distracted while I'm waiting to see my desires come to pass. I'm not doing that. Now we see an example of what we can do in those times so that we can be successful in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 in the amplified Bible. He says to us looking away from all that will distract us. How do we do it? Look away from the distractions. When the cuss want to come up, look away from the distractions. When the frustration wants to get, look away from those things. I can't look away. I can't look away. Why you can't? You can look at it, then you can look away. Well, I, I don't know, preacher. I've been living in it. You, I can't take it. Look away. Now, I can help you look away. If I slap you, you will definitely look away. <laughs> you will look dead at me like, preacher, did you just slap me? You ain't going to think about what was happening in your house because now you want to throw down. All right, now, let me take my earrings off, oh, bro. Bro, I used to do this. What happened? I just distracted you. And now you want to fight me. So you can look away. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, look away. It says, and focus our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the perfecter of our faith. The first incentive, incentive of our belief and the one who brings our faith to maturity. Who for the joy of accomplishing the goal set before him endured the cross. I'm looking at Jesus. He's a good example. Disregarding the shame, sat down at the right hand of the throne of God, revealing his deity, his authority, and the completion of his work. Look away, but when you look away, look at Jesus. He, he, if anybody who, who can be an example of how do you handle, you know, distractions on that level, it's certainly Jesus. He didn't even allow a cross to be a distraction. The Bible says when he went to the cross, he did it for the joy. So the beating and the spitting and all that, he didn't get distracted by because it was a joy knowing that one day that Tony Brazelton would lift up his hands and thank Jesus for going to a cross and paying the price for all of my sin. I would be one of many around the world, including you, that would just be grateful. Grateful that Jesus put my sin on that cross. How did he maintain walking through and not being distracted to change his mind? Because at any time, Jesus could have changed his mind. He could have called down a legion of angels. He was God in the flesh. He could have turned the whole thing up. You think you can hit me? Oh, look out in there. But God said he didn't do that for the joy that was set before him. He was never distracted. And that joy was you and I. He saw you. 
He saw me. He saw your children. He saw everyone that's in the earth. And that was greater than the pain that he had to walk through so that he could make sure that he could redeem you and I be, to become sons of God, that we could be all that he envisioned us to be and nothing would stop him. We're going for the great in this year. But here's the key. You need power to fulfill purpose. Tell your neighbor, you need power to fulfill purpose. Spiritually minded people realize that they need assistance to carry out their assignment. Did you hear me? People who are have spiritual intelligence, realize they need help. If they're going to fulfill an assignment, carry out a purpose. They realize they need the help so they don't get burnt out, so that they won't grow weary in well-doing, so that they won't get overwhelmed by what they're confronted with. Say this, we need power to fulfill purpose. Now let's look at a powerful picture of this in the life of Jesus and his disciples. Jesus tells his disciples, I have trained you. I have mentored you. I have discipled you. I have coached you for three years and I did it for a reason. This is an and I want you to go out and I want you to represent me to a world. I want there to be a contribution of who I am to this world. Because you, you're not just here just to live a good life. You, you, you are here to add a, a level of contribution from that world to here. And he said, now, I, I want you to represent me before man. Well, Glory. He put it this way, Jesus <laughs> said, so, so before you do that, here's what Jesus said. Although you have been discipled, although you have been mentored, although you've been coached, although you've been trained by me, although you have some on-the-job experience, although you have observed me for these three years, and although you've heard me teach, and you sat all through all of my sessions. Jesus told the disciples in Luke chapter 24, verse 49, in the NIV version, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power on high. Did you see that? They walked with Jesus for three years. They were trained by the best. They were discipled and mentored and coached by the best. They even had experiences of what he taught in their own personal life. And he said to them, do not try to do what I'm calling you to do until you clothe with power. Tell your neighbor, get the power. We need to get the power for our lives personally. We need to get the power for our lives relationally. We want, need to get the power for our lives mentally, the power emotionally. We need to get the power to live lives spiritually. We need to get the power. Purpose needs power. Just because you know the Bible, just because you know what God is telling, just because you have the purpose, just because you have the perspective, just because you have the knowledge, doesn't mean it's time to go. You need the power. Tell your neighbor, get the power. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, I know you got the purpose. I know you have the principles. I know you have the perspective. I even know you have the partners, people that will support you. But don't try to do anything until you get the power. People will try to push you out before it's time. 
I know you got the partners to help the people, but you don't have the power. Don't go until you get the power. You can do what they're doing. My question, do you got the power? We see that in John chapter 20 and 19 and 21. When Jesus, you know, he had been raised from the dead, he, he goes to visit his disciples there hiding in a house for fear of the Jews. And Jesus said to them, as the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. As the Father has sent me, I'm sending you. That's what God's saying to you and I. See, you, you're here not to be just a good person. You're here to, to contribute to life. So he says, as God has sent me, I'm sending you. And then in the next verse, he says to them, and when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Ghost. I gave you a word, but you need the power. You, you, you have the purpose. What's the purpose? I'm sending you as I was sent, but you need the power. Don't you leave until you get the Holy Ghost. Ooh, Jesus. The coming of Jesus or the incarnation of Jesus is an introduction to the possibility of greatness. See, Jesus' coming is also an indication of God's desire to rescue us from a life of being normal and regular and ordinary and average. He didn't just come to save you. He came to do that, but he came to rescue you from living such ordinary and average and, and normal lives. He came to offer you the possibility of greatness. You can be great. John chapter 14, verse 12, Jesus makes this statement about your greatness and mine. He says, most surely I say unto you, he who believes in me. Anybody believe in Jesus? He said, the words that I, the works that I do, he will do also and greater and greater and greater and greater. Jesus came to give you the possibilities of greater. And greater works than these, he will do. Why? Because I go to my Father. So I, I need you to, the coming of Jesus introduced you and I to the possibility of greatness. We're no longer to settle for a normal, average, ordinary life. God is expecting us to contribute to the world that we're in. Amen. Ordinary people don't contribute very much to the world. Oh, I, I can't wait to tell you what I mean by that. But God, is, that's what God is doing. Oh, Lord. So what's significant about Jesus coming? What's significant about Jesus going to the Father? What's significant about it? He doesn't want you to be average. What's significant about Jesus going to the Father? He doesn't want you to be normal. He wants you to have power. He says in John 16, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. Jesus leaving is to give you and I the advantage. What in the world are we going to do with the advantages that God has given us? We have an advantage that the world doesn't have. But we distracted about our paychecks, how much money we make, what kind of car we drive. Those are only distractions. And yet God left to give you an advantage. This advantage doesn't, it allows you and I not to be ordinary. This advantage just allows to live with the possibilities that come from another world. This, this, this advantage allows us to represent the kingdom. It allows us to stand in the places that God himself would stand and do what he would do if he was here. I'm giving you the advantage. But you and I don't see it because we're not reaching for it. We're not going after it. We're just hearing words. And we get up from our spaces and places and go home and still be ordinary. 
still average, still normal. And yet the coming of Jesus came to rescue from that. What happens to the world shouldn't happen to you. Why, you're not ordinary. What happens to the world shouldn't happen to you. You're not average. What happens to your marriage shouldn't happen to other people's marriage. Nothing. We're not average. But it happens to us because we act like average people. We fuss like average people. We act like we don't have an advantage. What's happening? We're being distracted from the possibility of being great. See, the devil knows that God has spoken greatness into your life. The devil knows that you are special, you are unique, that God's hand is on you for this generation. And he knows the only way to stop what you can present and bring to a world is get you to be distracted by your own personal affairs. You're so fussing about this and that that you're so normal. He says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, that's your advantage. We know that we need help. The helper will not come to you, but if I depart, I will send him the helper to you. One of the translations calls the helper the advocate. What's an advocate? A person who publicly supports. God is saying, I'm going to send you the Holy Ghost and he going to publicly show up for you. This is not just going to be a private God. I'm going to be a public God. I'm about to show up where it looks impossible. I want the world to know that you're my children and that I am a God. And I'm sending you the support that's going to support you publicly. When you open your mouth, I will confirm it. If you said it, I'll make it come to pass. God says, I am a public God. I got public children and I'm sending you to the public and I got the one who will support you. You're not to be average. He went on to say in that same chapter, however, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, we're going to have truth because everything is a lie, it's a distraction. He will guide you into all truth. He's going to guide me out of all the lies and the distractions that I'm living under. I'm living under the influence of how you treated me and how you act. I'm living under the influence of my past relationship. Don't know how to bust out of that and move forward. I'm treating my new relationship based on what I've been through in my past. Well, he going to lead me out of that. He going to lead you into a reality you ain't broke. He going to lead you into a reality that, that you're not living by a paycheck. He's going to lead you to reality that you got access to a God and you have access to a kingdom without limits. He's going to lead you into a reality that you realize that you are a son of the most high king. Oh, glory. And when you realize who you are, you realize I've got access to a world that has no limits. Everything else is a diversion. It's a lie. We get up every day, we live by what we see and how we eat and what's in the paycheck. And it's constantly being a diversion to the life that God's calling you to live. It's the reason that we don't see the supernatural and what God intended when he went to the cross. But we are learning in this season to have fixed purpose and to do so. I've got to ignore those things. I know that they exist. I know that they're real, but they're not my reality. The Bible says, if God be for you, I said, if God be for you, I said he for you, then what could be against you? Who could be against you? Them things are nothing but a distraction because God's for me. I heard what the doctor, I, I, I know what I got, the bills I got to pay. Do you ever notice that God never gives you 
the baby before he gives you a word for the baby. And if you can take the word, you'll have the baby. In other words, everything that happens to you and I comes word first, then the manifestation. If you're waiting on the manifestation, you can't get it until you learn how to take the, the word. He said to Mary, I'm going to give you a baby. He didn't say, well, Mary said, how did Mary get? Mary said, be unto me according to your word. Mary realized I got to receive the word in order to have a baby. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I really need to get to what I want to get to, but this is too good. So you can be greater. I know you don't feel greater. And that's been a problem. We live by how we feel. Your feelings is a distraction. What you see is a distraction. For we walk by faith and not by sight. Sight is distracting you. What you're seeing in your checkbook, what you're seeing in your body, what you're hearing from people other than God is a distraction. Listen, nobody knows you better than God. The doctor don't know you better than God. He went on to say in John 14, and, and whatever you ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. And if you ask anything, if you ask anything, somebody say greatness. greatness. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Amen. <sighs> Jesus left here, sent you the Holy Spirit, sent you and I the helper so that you and I could be empowered with the same thing that made him great. The same thing that made Jesus great makes you great. Amen. He was in flesh and blood, but he had the spirit. We see that in 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 in the King James Verse. He said, you are of God. Tell your neighbor, I'm of God. He said, you are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Why? Because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Jesus went there so that the greater one will be in there. If the greater one is in you, how are you average? How are you normal? Jesus had the greater one and he wasn't normal. He wasn't ordinary. Greater is he that's in you. Than he that is in the world. What's in the world? It's not greater than him. The sickness, the disease, the, the things that the world throws, it's not greater than the greater one. <laughs> do, do, you, do you know what, God faces whatever you face? God moves whenever you move. What do you mean? You want to see God move? You want to move a God? You want another move of God? Y'all y'all like moves of God? God's on the inside of me. When I move, God moves. We looking for a move of God and God is moving with you. God's on the inside of you. God is waiting for you to move. He got on the inside of you because he wants to contribute to what's happening in the world. You're waiting for a move of God. Move! Lay hands on the sick. Cast out the devil. Open the blind eyes. Raise the dead. Isn't that what he said to them? Raise the dead. People think, well, I can't do that. Why not? God's in you. He's on the inside of you, but we keep living like ordinary, average, regular people. I don't want nothing regular. No, I, I want what God wants for me. But that doesn't happen just because you have a desire for it. Things don't happen because you have a desire. Things happen because you made a choice. That woman sitting beside you, you married, you chose that. You ran after that. You bit that. You gave that to rabies, whatever. <laughs> I ran after Pastor Cynthia. We was on the basketball court and I'm shooting. I said, good, good. Who is that? She said, she came over and spoke to me. I'm like, hey. 
I said, girl, too fine to be speaking to me. Don't you know fine women don't speak to men because they don't know how to handle that. They think, oh, I'm in the game. She spoke to me and got on the bike and rode away. I said, let me get on my bike and follow her. <laughs> she was with another dude I did not care. I got on my bike and says, hey, nothing just happens, brother. You better go get that thing. You better go get that. Because somebody going to be with you, who you supposed to be with. I caught up with him, and I caught up with them. I said, hey, how you doing? I spoke to him. But that wasn't my focus. I had fixed purpose. And he wasn't in the picture. I didn't care who he was, what he was, and how he looked. I said, oh, my God, I'm following her wherever she going. And I'm saved, too, and I'm riding my, and talking to him. I said, what's wrong with you, boy? This stuff people do when you're not saved. And, and I said, you, you can't be doing, you can't chase women when you're saved. What you doing? I, I said to myself, I, I can't even hear that. Why? I had fixed purpose. Well, tell me you can't have fixed purpose. I wouldn't be moved. Never. My heart was fixed. <laughs> and look, I, I, I got the prize, right? I'm, I'm good. Okay, that's, a, that's all I'm going to tell you. Now, you can watch yours go down the street and somebody take an arm and be walking away. Not me, bruh. I ain't that kind of coward. Like, if I want something, I'm going to get it. All you can say is no. But I won't get a no until I go get it. And I ain't used to taking a no when I want something. And now that I'm saved, I don't take a no. The devil is always trying to tell you what you can't have, what you can't do, who you are, what you should not be doing, where you should live, how you do that. Ah, shut up! It says in Ephesians 3 and 20, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above, above all that you can ask or think. Watch this. According to a power. Where's the power? In you. How in the world are you ordinary? How you can have the power of God on your life and you live your entire life like just mere men? I'm not doing it. I'm not. I'm, 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 I'm not. I'm not. I'm not happy like that. God, not doing it. Jesus didn't come just to show us what he can do. He came to show us what you can do. God is not, I'm going to close with this. God has not only given us the ability for greatness, but he's given us the responsibility for greatness. I need to say that again. Say it again, preacher. <laughs> God not only has given us the ability in you, it's already in you, for greatness, but he's also given you and I the responsibility for greatness. Tell your neighbor, you're responsible. Tell them on the other side. I said, you're responsible. No, no, you're really responsible. You're responsible for greatness. And let me give you an example of that so you won't. Go to Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, and this is when I'm going to close. Genesis 12, verse 2. Notice what God said to Abraham. God gave him the ability, and then God gave him the responsibility. He says, I will make of you a great nation. Who's saying that? God, I will. I will. I will. This is what God will do. I'm going to make you a great nation, Abraham. And I will bless you. Who's going to do that? God's going to bless you. Ain't going to be your job. God's going to do this. This is what he's going to do. And I will make your name great. And you will. I will and you will. I will and you will. I will and you will. This is what I will and you will. 
God's going to make you great. But he's going to hold you responsible for your greatness. Your ability to bless others, listen to me, will be determined by your willingness to accept and pursue greatness. Your ability to bless others will be determined by your willingness to set your gaze on the path before you with fixed purpose, looking straight ahead, ignoring life's distractions. That's the only way you're going to get there. Setting your gaze on the path of greatness. Nobody wins an Olympic gold medal without fixed purpose. Nobody gets to be the president of the United States without fixed purpose purpose. Now, when I'm teaching, it's not, I'm, it's not churchy stuff. I'm, I want you to use this for life. I want you to use this in your personal life. Use it in your business life. Use it in your work relationships. Use it in your home life with your family, your friends, your relatives, your children. I, I, you got to use this. This stuff works. God has called you to be great on your job. If you started a business, God's calling your business to be great. But it won't be great without fixed purpose. Setting your gaze on the path that is before you. Looking straight ahead and ignoring life's distractions. The blessing on your life will contribute to you becoming a person of influence. And I'm not talking about in the church. You should be a person of influence on your job. You should be. I don't care what level they bring you in. When it's all done and say, said for, you should be a person of influence. Stop tripping. Well, that job is too low for me. Get on there. Greatness will show up. They will promote you because of the greatness on your life. Because of the greater one that's on the inside of you. And because you are pursuing greatness, all of us will recognize that and they will promote you. My money don't determine how great I am. God will use your greatness when you're great. He'll use your influence to be a blessing to others. That's why you and I got to walk in greatness. We were not called to be people of just ethics. We were also called to be people who contribute. We were not just called to live right. I don't know, we just make that the big thing. Man, you ought to live right. No, we were, we were, there's more to us than just living right. We were also called to make the world a better place. That's why he says, go ye in all the world. Go you and all the world. Go you and all the world. We are, we are supposed to make the world a better place. We are the light of the world. Our life is the light of the world. We, we, we should be contributing when we're on our jobs. We should not be people on our job that is normal and ordinary and average. Why? Because God wants to elevate you and then use you to be a blessing to them. When God can get you in a place of influence, when people now respect you and look to you, then you will be in a position to begin to influence them for God. So God wants to make you great. Not to make you great just for you to be for yourself. God wants to make you great. Why? Because God wants to make you a blessing. How do I become a blessing? Fixed purpose. I mean, if I'm, if I'm a waiter in, in any store, I'm going to be the best waiter anybody's ever seen. I'm going to have smiles on my face. I'm going to be shining and everything. 
People are going to love me. They're going to remember me. Why? Because people like that get remembered. They will come back to the store want to sit where I'm serving. They will give me the biggest tips. Not that I need your money, but because God wants to make me a blessing. They're open, God will open their ears because of who I am to them. I'll be able to tell them about Jesus. I'll be able to heal the sick, cast out devils. I'll be able to minister the gospel because God makes me a blessing. Doesn't matter where you're at. You don't have to be in a big Fortune 500 company. Joseph, thrown in a pit, in prison, in slavery. And God made Joseph an influence made him great and when it was all done and said for he stood second in the entire kingdom how did he get there because he had to go through some stuff fixed purpose he would have never made it when that girl threw that booty at him come on here Joseph get this Joseph says hey I will not do that to my God Take your little nasty self up out of here. Devil! I'm going to cast you out. Now, I know how you are on your job because the devil will come after you on your job. They sit booties on tables in your job. I know that. I used to work. Glad I don't work no more there. I had a girl said, I will lick you from your shoe up. I said, no, you will not because I'm a man of God. Amen. I said, you want me, but I'm already given. But what I have for you, you're going to need it. I, you need Jesus. She gave her life to God. You better talk before you get distracted. Start looking at how fine she is and stuff she got you like. About, well, who was I? No, nah, we don't want that story. You don't, that's a distraction. No, 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 no. You talk quick. When they come for you, come quick. You want to give me something? I want to give you something too. I do that with people selling me drugs when I was at work. Hey, psst, 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 psst. hey, psst, psst, psst. I'm coming out of seven. Now. Hey, psst, psst, psst. you talking to me? Yep. Yeah, Man, you want to buy some weed? I say, deal, yes. Before I buy the weed, you got to let me, I want to ask you, do you want to buy what I got? He's like, what you got? I said, no, nah, you can't handle what I got. I walked away. He said, where you going? I said, man, you ain't ready. He said, what you mean I ain't ready? I said, look at you. You in the corner. My stuff is bad. He looked at me like, well, where is it at? I said, I'm gone, man. I got to get in the car, man, I'm, and I'm pimping too. He chasing me. He chasing me. I ain't got no bag. I got Jesus. And guess what? He chased me and I led him to the Lord. I carried God on the inside of me. Greater is he on the inside of me than he that is in the world. I'm not letting no devil dominate me. You just came in the presence of God. You about to bow your knee. Do you understand? Stop bowing your knee. Being distracted. Oh, I'm having too much fun preaching. Say, I need power to fulfill purpose. Your existing in the earth is not ordinary. It's not regular. It's not average. You're not the result of a mass production. You've been customized by your creator. You are unique. You are different. You, your differences make you are necessary for you to fulfill your purpose. The reason you loud is for a purpose. Why don't you just be quiet? I can't. It goes along with my purpose. Why are you, why are you all strong about everything? Because what God called me to do, I'm the Samson of this thing. 
See, you, you let people do whatever they need to do because God has designed them for a purpose and, and you and I are not the person to tell them what they're supposed to do because you don't know the design. And when you know the design, then you'll get online. But God knows they just And God put them up like that, made them look like that. We say they weird. No, 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 no. They're unique. And God designed them for a purpose. Stop trying to get them to conform to you and everybody else. If they want to wear whatever. It's all right with me. I ain't got no problems with that. You can ring up and down. You can tattoo all around. Don't bother me. I got delivered when my kids were smoking weed. I'm delivered. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Stand to your feet. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. Get up. I love y'all. Thank you for allowing me to, to just be excited by myself. Can somebody give God some praise up here? Somebody shout, fix purpose. Tell somebody, I will not be moved forever. Even though you're getting on my nerves, I will not be moved forever. <laughs> some of, some of y'all leave your job because people are getting on your nerves. That person getting on your nerves is a distraction to you. It's supposed to be an opportunity for you to grow. Not for you to move on. Yeah. Oh, we did. We had communion. I never saw that. Well, lift your communion cup up. I go home and my daughter said, Dad, you should have shut up. Well, no, she didn't say it like that. She just, she just looks at me and like, you know, you're the pastor. I've given her the road to Help me stay in line so it's, it's, he's not doing that, you know, disrespectful. She's trying to help me help myself. <laughs> so, and she, so she just reminds me, you know, Dad. Oh, that's, this one ain't mine. Okay. All right. Come on, let's, let's, let's fix this thing. Can we settle this? Can we, can we start to try to grab hold of what God has for us in 2024? I just, don't you, let's, let's be great this year. Let's make a decision, make a choice to be great. Why? Because of what Jesus, his death and burial and resurrection is for that. On the day he was betray, betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he said, eat. This is my body broken for you. I command every sickness, every disease, every infirmity, go from this house. High blood pressure, go in the name of Jesus. Nervous conditions, I command you, go, I said in Jesus' name. Arthritis, go in Jesus' name. Copper tunnel, go in the name of Jesus. Heart palmitations in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I command it, go! Feet and ankle problems. I speak to them now in the name of Jesus. I command those feet and ankles to be strong now in Jesus' name. I command you to live because 2024 is your year of purpose. We're going to find out how good God is. Lift the cup, a cup of blessings. It says, and often as you do it, you do remember me. Drink. Say, I'm blessed and I cannot be cursed. Oh my God, I get to take it two times. 
<laughs> Thank you, Jesus. I take all of them in. <clears throat> now let's close, let's go home. But here's what I need you to do. See, my desire is that you become a contributor. God don't have people in the earth not contributing to his kingdom. People ought to look at you and come to church. They ought to watch your life because it's a light to them. They said, come to God because of you. And because of me. If you're here this morning and you've never given your life to God, I'm going to ask you to get out of your seat and meet me at the altar. The altar is where everything takes place. We dedicate our babies. We get married. We meet Jesus. We just do so many things at the altar. We pray. We believe God together. Number two, if you need to rededicate your life, I'm going to ask you to, <clears throat> to come and meet me. Don't be ashamed of it. Number three, you need the baptism of the Holy Spirit with the evidence of praying in the Spirit. And last but not least, if, if this is not your community, your family, your church, well, preacher, I got a church. Well, maybe God's telling you something else. <clears throat> but whatever God's telling you, that's what you do. And so I want you to look around and ask those four things. But you need to give your life to God. I bind the devil that would make people keep from moving out of their seat. Devil, loose the people of God. You need to rededicate your life. Get out of that seat. 2024 is going to be our greatest year. Not just mine, but all of ours. I need to rededicate my life. Rededication doesn't mean you don't love the God. It just means what we do all the time. Just recommit, reestablish, because we want what heaven wants. And last but not least, this is not your family I want it to be. All right. Because you ask everybody near you. Everybody in here is saved. If you're saved, lift your hand up. <clears throat> Thank you. I love you, baby. If you need to rededicate your life, lift your hand up. <laughs> if you just want prayer after I'm finished, I'm going to ask the elders to come and stand in to pray with you because we believe in agreeing with you. <clears throat> we just want you to have the best life that you're supposed to have. I want you to point your hand to this great woman of God. Thank you, babe. Yeah, it's all good. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. It's the best thing we'll ever do in our life. I did a lot of things in life, but the best thing I've ever done, really, was to let Jesus into my life. I, uh, anybody, anybody else got that as a witness? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. I felt that's the best thing I've ever done. I've done a lot of things ain't good. And I've done some good things. A lot of good things, baby. Thank you. But I do thank God. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh. I'm grateful. I could be somewhere else. <clears throat> I could be in a grave. I could I could be in the streets doing some crazy stuff. I'm grateful. I'm forever grateful. You've been you been good to me, boy, I tell you. I don't know your story, but mine is 
grateful. When you sit in a room and you think about killing yourself, I'm grateful. Yes, sir. Yeah. Grateful, Doc. Because I could be dead. Who would have thought I'd be doing something like this? When I'm in that room thinking about it. Ending it all. So I'm grateful. Yeah, so I got tears. And I'm not ashamed of it. Turn around and ask somebody again. You sure you're going to make heaven if your eyes close? When we get to heaven, we all be friends. Who you think going to come to that big mansion you got up there? It's going to be me. You're going to come to mine. I'm going to come to yours. We're going to be friends forever. Heaven is wonderful. And we get to, you know, God makes your mansion out of what you like. I already know what my wife's mansion is. It's going to be full of bling and stuff. He even, he even allow you to take the pets you really love. Notice I put the word really love. <laughs> Heaven is wonderful. And everybody in it will be a part of that family. I will know you forever. You will know me forever. We'll be family forever. That's why we down here, we, we might as well family up now. What's the point? Together we can make his dreams come true. Father, I lift the wonderful people that are here great man of God, the great women are here. <clears throat> There's greatness on the inside of all of us. I recognize it because you recognize it. This church recognizes it. We're not great because of what we do. We're great because who's in us. It's not based on a performance. It's based on his performance. So God, I bless them. I pray for them. Pray the divine protection of them. 2024 would be the year you had in mind for them. Devil, I bind your tactics against their lives. And God, I release the angels that you've sent to, to encompass them and take care of them, to watch over them in all of their ways. And that their 2024 would see your dreams and their dreams come true. In Jesus' name. I love you. Now, I need you to follow the lady with the pink. She's going to put something in your hand, and, and that'll be it. Okay. Well, that, huh? go get a purse. Yeah, because I might get some money out of there. <laughs> um, um, everybody else, lift your hand. For all my first-time visitors, you first-time visitor, if you would step out right now. Thank you, Lord. We're going to take all of our first-time visitors somewhere. Who's the person going to take the first-time visitors? Red in the aisle. Okay, all my first-time visitors. Would you follow this beautiful lady with the red shirt? Huh? Okay. You, you want to do both, huh? I want, I want you in both places. Huh? Okay, next Sunday. All right, they said they'll go that way next Sunday. Go ahead, be a first-time visitor. All right. Huh? Let me make that announcement. Well, did you get anything? Good. Amen. Praise God. One additional announcement on Saturday, uh, January 27th, the Primetime Ministry. All those that are part of Primetime, they will be having a fellowship at the Golden Corral in Waldorf, Maryland at noon on January 27th after. Everybody say After. After the fast, after that time of God, amen. January 27th at noon in Waldorf, Maryland at the Golden Corral. All those that are part of prime time, we all young at heart. So you can come and fellowship. It's a time of fellowship and getting together in this time as well. Also, ladies, don't forget tomorrow night, Virtuous Women. This is the first of a quarterly, the quarterly meeting. So definitely you want to make sure that you kick it off right this year. Amen. We're coming out in person tomorrow at 7 o'clock p.m. Amen. How many enjoyed the word? Somebody shout no distractions. 
Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for the word of God that we've heard today, Lord God, and we thank you, Father, that we're ever laser focused, God, on the path that you set before us, Lord God, and that, Father, we will ignore all of these distractions in the name of Jesus and yield to the power that's on the inside of us, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, you are dismissed. Go ahead and greet, give one another a hug and say, just, oh, and if you desire prayer, we're asking the elders to come on down to the front if you desire prayer you may come down to see any one of the elders that will agree with you and release faith in the power of God amen if you desire prayer